I want to talk about a box and um, how a box has led me on a journey recently to new ways to think both about the theater I make and also how I might want to live in the world. And I want to talk about the box as it relates to one of my great heroes. He's a tremendous philosopher and a sage. He's my spiritual guide these days and an artistic inspiration. And I'm completely in love with this guy and crazy as it sounds, um, but I mean it really truly, it is none other than <laughs> SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> The little yellow guy who lives in a pineapple under the sea that I'm lucky to be making a musical about. Um, when I first started on this project, which was actually about eight years ago, I sat down at the beginning and I tried to watch as many of these 11 minute episodes as I could, and one that quickly emerged as, my, yeah. Um, well, you know, I found that I could only watch like two at a time um, because of the speed at which they meet. Um, and I uh, had one that quickly emerged as my favorite, which was an episode called Idiot Box. <laughs> and um, this episode was, of course, as the title suggests, about something s seemingly very simple and insignificant, which is a cardboard box. But in this episode, what happens is SpongeBob and his best friend Patrick receive a box which is there to deliver a flat screen television to them. And with a typical kind of SpongeBobian twist of logic, they decide that what they actually want to do is throw out the TV and keep the box to play in. And one of uh, SpongeBob's unique forms of genius, I think, is his ability to see the box as if for the first time. He's able to look at it not as uh, for how it's used, but for um, its intrinsic qualities. So he shows Patrick that they can get in the box and with, <laughs> you might have seen that before, <laughs> and uh, with nothing but their imagination, um, much as we might get into a black box theater, they're able to imagine that they're mountain climbers or they can launch a space shuttle, or uh, the box might also be a shape for playing a great game of hide and seek, or the box could become a radio that emits music, or the box could be a plank that a pirate walks on. And SpongeBob knows that the box is not one of these things. It's all of these things all at once. And um, he is able, th through that kind of vision, to, oh wait, I missed a slide here. That's right, that's all of these things. Um, uh, he's able to put forth a vision of, and this is funny, not either or, but yes <laughs> and. Um, so when I watched this episode, it immediately reminded me of a couple of things back in the day. The first was a movie called The Gods Must Be Crazy, which perhaps you've seen. It's uh, in this story, a Coke bottle falls out of the sky. It's thrown out of an airplane, and it happens to land intact in the hands of a tribe of Bushmen who have never seen a Coke bottle before. And just like SpongeBob with these kind of um, very childlike eyes full of wonder, they feel that the Coke bottle is the most beautiful and mysterious thing they've ever seen. And because it fell out of the sky, they determine that the gods must have given it to them as a gift, but they don't know what its purpose is. So they go about um, a series of explorations where they eventually figure out that they can use the bottle to play games, or they can cure snake skin, or they can even, like in this, blow into it to make music. And they conclude that a Coke bottle is actually the most extraordinarily useful thing that the gods have ever bestowed on mankind. And um, 
also back in the day when I was watching this episode, it caused me to remember something from my childhood, which I hadn't thought about in a long time. And it was one day um, when I was in grade school, my teacher came in and brought five pennies and said to the classroom, look at these pennies as if they're artifacts from an ancient civilization. And try to look at them with new eyes and tell me what can you deduce about this civilization from these artifacts. And one kid said, well, the civilization had five cents. And another kid <laughs> said, I think the civilization had a president that also was Lincoln. <laughs> and, and I remember precisely the moment, and it was really a moment where I felt that I saw these pennies as if for the first time. And I, I, I was so clear about it that I shouted out, this is God. This is what God looks like. And everyone kind of laughed at me. Um, but I knew because I had seen the words in God we trust right above this being that this, in fact, must be God. So um, that's, uh, yeah, that's something SpongeBob gets instinctively, which is how to define something, not only by how it's used, but by what it is combined with. And in the uh, episode of Idiot Box, he explores this. Again, not only various uses for the box, but what happens if we put the box with something else. So the identity of the box shifts when it's combined with um, the wheel of a ship, a ship's wheel, or whatever that would be called. I don't know if it has a name. Um, or perhaps when it's combined with a second box that's together in a boxing ring, <laughs> you know, because boxes, box. <laughs> okay. Um, imagine, this, this, is, this is SpongeBobian humor. Um, so imagine if you're in a white room and you're with a box and then there suddenly appears to you a classic bust that just comes on the box or maybe something like a black set of wings. And you're suddenly able to see the box not just in greater definition, because those two things um, juxtapose each other and each defines the other more greatly, but what you're also able to see is something brand new, which is one newly created thing made from two disparate objects, in this case, a flying box. Um, okay, where the heck am I? Who knows? Oh, yeah, so. When I um, went to Los Angeles, I met with the creators of SpongeBob, who were incredibly helpful. And one of them said to me, we worship at the altar of Dada. And another said, everything in is, is an homage to the surreal, which made great sense to me because in surrealism, um, you're looking at a lot of familiar objects that are being put together in unfamiliar ways. And it made sense to me that this would be the world in which, <laughs> in which SpongeBob lives. Um, you know, he's a sponge who lives in a pineapple, who has a pet snail named Gary, who meows. Um, just as, you know, the basic example of, these, of how these things go together. Um, so here I am one day at the Oriental Theater in Chicago where we're going to do the first production of SpongeBob. And I started thinking, well, if a box is not only a box, how is a theater not only a theater? And if SpongeBob could take a box and throw out the TV and put something else in it, how could I take the theater and throw out the musical and put something else in it or many things in it? which is why I started conceiving of the musical not as a musical, but as a rock concert or and a party and a runway show. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and an aquarium and a carnival. 
and not just as one of these things in the space, but all of them, all together and all at once. Um, my favorite play I've ever directed is a, a play by William Saroyan called In the Time of Your, called The Time of Your Life. And in it, he describes his work as a play, a dream, a poem, a travesty, a fable, a symphony, a parable, a comedy, a tragedy, a farce, a vaudeville. I'm not going to read the whole thing because my countdown clock is going. So you get the idea. Anything you like, whatever you please. And I believe any play, any work of art should be several things, all inseparable, all making a whole. So this celebration of multiplicity is what's at the core of SpongeBob. And it applies not only to props and architecture, but also to characters that are each kind of a unique collaged concoction who somehow managed to form a unified whole that is an extreme case of biodiversity. And uh, it's also why I chose when working on the show to not enlist one composer to write the score, but many, uh -huh. thinking that um, each flavor that one contributed would be enhanced and strengthened by being next to another. And yet somehow the whole score would be more varied and surprising and true to SpongeBob's sensibility than any one of them could have achieved on their own. So why does this matter? Why does any of this matter other than one show and uh, you know, one thought about the theater? It matters to me because I believe that when I make something on stage, I have the honor and the privilege and the opportunity of creating the world anew, of imagining a universe that's created from scratch. And that thing um, can, is this going? Oh, there we go. Um, and that thing can look like anything we choose. It can be a um, reflection of the world or a criticism of it or a mashup of it. And I believe that well-made plays and formulaic musicals give us comfort because they resolve and they tell stories that make sense and they look like reality as we understand it but I believe that they don't express what I would describe as kind of the full chaotic, kaleidoscopic, contradictory mashup mess that is life. And that if I'm able to tell stories and create worlds that express that full chaotic, contradictory, kaleidoscopic mashup that is life, um, it's an opportunity of proposing the world anew, a way of being in the world, and of encouraging our audiences, um, helping them, and dare I say, even training them to see, to recognize, and cherish the immense variety and diversity that exists in our world. I'm almost done. So. <laughs> All right, so, so here's the thing. Um, SpongeBob knows, uh, like the, the poet Wallace Stevens in one of my favorite poems knows, 13 ways to look at a blackbird, that nothing is one thing. Um, and in you know, applying labels to ourselves, we shrink our imaginations, we limit our ability to love, and as intersectionality, this world that's being bandied about these days in politics reminds me I'm not, you know, a woman or a Jewish person or a lesbian or a theater director. I'm all of these things and more, as are you, and as is the person sitting next to you, and as is this theater. So SpongeBob with the cardboard box reminded me of these three things to wrap up. The first, Oh no, I skipped this beautiful slide I made. Um, that's the world with everything in it. <laughs> okay, but that's not the end. He, uh, he, he reminded me to um, let go of the either or, to embrace the yes and. 
He reminded me to see beyond the mono of monotheism and monotony and monarchy um, and go further into the multi of, of multifaceted multitudinous. And above all, reminded me that it is diversity above all else that gives the world our dimension. It's a worldview with a wide lens. It's a democratic view. It tells stories about communities over individuals. It embraces all viewpoints instead of there being one right way. And um, it asks us to be in and experience the world as something uh, in which you can play with and cherish and celebrate everything and everyone. And that's one of the things my hero has given me so far, and I am honored and grateful to share his ideas, his view, through me with you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.